So I know I complained last week about being thrown into to tier four, which is an entirely new tier. Oh, of... they created a new lockdown tier for yeah. you guys. And the reason for this lockdown tier was because of this new strain of COVID that was circulating in the UK and the world. So I'm going to do something a little bit different. So we're going to be doing the next few papers in almost chronicle, chronological order of like okay. when they were released. So the first thing I'm, I'm pulling up is this um, nerve tag meeting uh, summary, which is... Uh, what happened Very to be... scary sounding. <laughs> yes, it, it is. Nerve tag. New and emerging respiratory virus threats advisory group. Okay. <laughs> yeah. So uh, this... Um, this is a government briefing, so again, it's not quite like um, the papers we're looking at, but it begins on 18th of December where there was like an emergency meeting called about this new strain called VU 2020-12-01. And they identify it immediately as like having this uh, strange uh, N501Y mutation. Um, and th there was a worrying growth in people of, with cases of this disease. So early indicators suggest that it transmits uh, between 65 and 75 percent more effectively compared to the original strains. So that's kind of a, a panic point. And uh, let's see whether because there are a couple because this entire document is like almost designed to make you like kind of f like afraid. Afraid. Yeah. yeah. Well, I mean because it's it's a it's a group right that's trying to urge the government to do something. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yeah. So, like, there's a bit where it says, like, while previous variants have successfully emerged in periods of low prevalence with, without clear evidence of selective advantage, the emergence and subsequent dominance of this new strain in a period of relatively high prevalence suggests that there is a selective advantage over other variants. So, but I mean, like, the funny thing is, is like, that's the same. This is almost just like a more formal version when we saw that D614G mutation. And like, that's what it's reading to me, at least at this point, right? Yeah. Is that like, this is just like, they've seen the genomes, they've seen this gen genomic variant, and they see that genomic variant is becoming very, very prevalent, right? And so the question is, is it founder effect or is it right, actual? Um, yeah. Driven yeah. So that's going to be a, a bit of a difficult one because I think that we're going to have to uh, go into that a little bit more because again they they do in the we'll go into that a bit more in the block of papers we have. Uh, another yeah. thing that that again is butt puckering is when they mention antigenic escape. Uh, the location of mutations are in a receptor binding domain of the spike protein that raises that range, that raises the possibility that this variant is antigenically distinct from prior variants, which would be a bad bad thing for reinfections and for vaccines so uh but again it seems like they don't have much like they, have, they haven't presented all the evidence yet but yeah because was... i mean if this is just the bullet point th th like, these yeah. are like these high level things that they're trying to use to convince the government to make some sort of action right because right because it's good better safe than sorry right but from what we know in terms of antigenic escape, there's a lot of places on the RB, right? Like we've yeah. seen that map, right? That there are certain residues that are very important. There's some that aren't. So like, how did this match up? This doesn't tell us that. Yeah, it, it doesn't tell you tell us much, oh, but this it was enough for the government to, well, this and then various other information was enough for the government to go, okay, we're inventing a new form of lockdown. Um, yeah. On the same day, they did release uh, a characterization of the genome, so preliminary genomic characterization of an emergent SARS-CoV-2 lineage in the UK defined by a novel set of spike mutations. Um, so uh, this is uh, a, a, well. So here they actually summarize what the mutations they found. Uh, so again, this one has um, so the yeah, thing. There's like a deletion. There's something in the fear near the fear and cleavage site, and then. They're saying that it's in the contact residues between ACE2 and the receptor binding domain. Yes, yeah, so the N501Y mutation is in the contact residues, which we also, I think, call the receptor binding domain. Um, mm -hmm. And also, like, um, and there's another P61H that's there as well. Um, and so they, and at this point, they, there's not much information, but there has been some characterization done of the N501Y uh, gene. So... They, there's been some mouse model experiments with it because it's because it's something that's been seen previously, and they found it did increase infectivity in in the mouse model. Um, 
and also the president was the 69th. What se- what is this? What is the source? I I don't know. Yeah, so curious Mar- it's geological yeah. dot org. <laughs> yeah, it doesn't have a DOI. It's not really a public. I mean, it feels like a publication though. It has references. It has data. <laughs> yeah, this is a weird thing because this has this should be in a preprint, but it feels like this is a this is a very odd source. It almost feels like a a blog, but it is like written by yeah, the. Yeah, it's like a it's like a highly scientific blog. <laughs> yeah. But this this was published by the COVID nineteen genomics Co- consortium in the UK, and it's kind of yeah. odd that they didn't go to the down like a med archive or bio archive route for publishing this. Um, no, but I, I thought it was cool. it's just like yeah. the source itself. Yeah, it's it's interesting. Um, so there's there's a lot of stuff. They call this the B one one seven mutation, which is much more much less of a mouthful than the other name. So that's what I'm going to call it from now on. Sure. Um, B seven. Yeah. Um, they also like to talk about the 60, the deletion in the 69 to 70 and the spike. Uh, so we've encountered this before on this uh, podcast because it was associated with the mink outbreak in Denmark. Um, so that had a, a different like RBD mutation. Um, and another and thing... I think, this, I think we may have also covered this when we were talking about the D614G. Yeah. There was a paper saying that there's all these other mutations, right? That right. Like, assort sometimes. So it's very hard to pick out just the one thing, right, that's going to cause a difference, right? Because sometimes it assorts with a bunch of things. And and I guess here, that's why they're calling it the B117 lineage, yeah. right, is a little bit more of a precise way to talk about it because it encompasses a bunch of kind of mutations. They can't really parse out which one is having the, the full effect. Maybe all three are having the effect, right? Exactly. Um, <clears throat> but at this point, we've collected quite a lot of genomes. So most of them are connected by the GISAID. Uh, so, uh, Global uh, in- Institute or something for Surveillance of Avian Influenza Disease that has been collecting all the genomes from coronavirus outbreak. Um, Sorry, Foz, did you say that there was mouse data in this? Uh, not in this paper, but it's oh, okay. been done in a previous paper that was uh, published a while ago. Let me see if I can pull up that uh, that on the screen, because I've got like that. Oh, they don't number their references. That's annoying. Um. <laughs> oh, see, if I just search for mouse in here, then maybe I'll find it. So, uh, oh, goo at all. I feel like we've seen that paper before. Yeah, adapting. <laughs> so, I feel like we might have actually covered that. Uh, because that was yeah. our part of our double header on on whether. Yeah. That's yeah. Right. So we've actually covered this mutation before. But... So that so that paper though is more about um. Adaptation. Is, is, yeah, it's more about the mouse model than it was the biological things they found, right? Right, yeah. So, again, that's not necessarily applicable to humans because, again, mice are already resistant to SARS-CoV-2. So, yeah. they're, so that adaptation... But this is one where they, they probably did something to the mouse. They, they gave it ACE2 <laughs> in uh, some way. Oh, no, I think this was the one where they adapted the SARS-CoV-2 to the, to the mouse rather than... Oh, right, where the... So, right. Yeah, so I think we were arguing over which one of these models would be better because one was adapting the ACE2, one was adapting the SARS-CoV-2, and I I think that we said that okay, they're both good for different uh, things. Um, yes, yes, I remember that. Yeah, so I did not expect that paper to actually be- come up again. So I'm. Um, so, yeah, yeah, well, I mean that's one of the things, right? Like it's hard, right? Like w- with this news, it's like it's this really big story because someone actually took action yeah right the government took action on it but like the scientific information that goes into it like it's it's sometimes the evidence is very minor right in some ways but but i think what's important is that like governments take even like the the hint of something dangerous seriously because like you don't there's so much unknown in this like Mm. it's like really taking that approach like well just in case right we might as well do these things um yeah. Oh, and one... Yeah, okay. I, I just pulled up the goo paper. Yeah, it is. We had talked about it before, I think. It's pretty short paper, and it's mostly about the creation of the model. <laughs> yeah. Where they passage these viruses. So these are, like, viruses that got adapted to the mouse, specifically. And then... I see. Then they have... Yeah, then they use this mutant... Vi- version and show that it doesn't what's going on here um a a unique 
Oh, no, it's the variant that they create yeah. <laughs> as the mutation. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Right? Is this N501? Is that Yeah, the... N501Y, so... Yeah. Right. That... So, <laughs> that's very strange, right? So, they're really what they're... <laughs> The information that they've had, they have about this mutation is is it makes it better for infecting mice. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that is actually yeah. right, and so that's why whenever you hear like someone say, "Oh, it's virulent in mice," you have to take that kind of with a big pinch of salt because, mm-hmm. yeah, normal SARS-CoV-2 isn't virulent in mice, so it's kind of hard to. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So yeah. That's a- it's information we have about the mutation. It, it tells us that it's in, involved in the binding, right? Yep. It's like in that binding region, right? Because we know that the reason why it doesn't infect mice is because it doesn't bind their ACE2 properly. Yeah. So it's like modifying its ability to bind the ACE2. I think this is also a good callback to the the ACE, the ACE2 decoys paper, yeah. right? Where we talked about if things change the binding interface, then that also means it's going to potentially bind less to... ACE2. Yeah. But it seems like the data that they're reporting here in terms of the population level is that, oh, but actually it seems like it's still infecting a lot of different people. <laughs> yeah. Right? So it's not really, uh, it's not becoming less fit. This mutation, even though one would predict maybe it would make it less fit in humans, it seems like it's still proliferating. Is that because it's assorting with other mutations? Is it because of this specific mutation? Unknown, right? But there's enough evidence, it sounds like, that, or that this evidence seems to be presented in such a way that they're encouraging uh, greater care in controlling, right, the outbreak. Yeah, yeah. so, yeah, the the actual fact that this is this mutation was found in mice before, during this mass adaptive model, is almost like, not necessarily, it's it's almost a confusing non sequitur, so you don't really know how, to, how this will apply to humans. Yeah, 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 exactly, exactly. Don't take it as a show of strength that, like, we should be really afraid of this mutation. More just, like, something that we also know about this mutation that we're not yeah. really sure it fits with the story yet. <laughs> I mean, like, I remember when I was working with strep, there was, like, a, a, a mouse adapted strep strain that was actually, like, missing some key proteins that would allow it to be infectious to humans. So, it's... So, with, with these sorts of animal studies, there's always swings and roundabouts. So, it's quite... Um, right. But, yeah. No, I'm glad you caught, caught that point. That's a really good... Good point. Yeah, always, always interesting, right? <laughs> yeah. Uh, uh, what yeah, else? The next the paper happened. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So the, on the same, so again, nineteenth October, the so this is basically this paper showing the map of like the the sequence coverage for for like the whole of the UK and areas where they've been sequencing more. So so Wales in the southeast, where coincidentally the strain appears. So this is almost like more data, but I think keeping in mind so that we can think about founder effects perhaps yeah absolutely but, and i think it's also just cool to see that they they really have quite a bit of sequence data yeah <laughs> well 20 percent or more i guess that's not super high but um yeah like but people, yeah there, there's a lot of sequence data coming from i mean all even, around the world. even one percent sequence data is actually quite a lot i mean comparing it to original like sars like 20 years ago or even something have oh sure yeah. absolutely yeah <laughs> yeah that's right <laughs> this is actually amazing, and it kind of shows how spoiled we... And also, like, bring up the point that early on this outbreak, when D614G was, was emerging, we didn't really see much outcry about it f- until later, mm-hmm. but I think the, da- the data was coming in quite scattered. Yeah, that's true. I, I think I think that's a really good point, that this is an action taken by the UK, right, mm. with a single government, right? They're primarily looking at data from their own from your own country right? yeah. and, and like making those decisions based on that data. But with that D614G, that was so early in the outbreak. It was like, those were just academics trying to like pull together disparate data sources and make some sort of um, like <laughs> comments, right. On everything. Maybe it was also a little bit too far in the past, right. Yeah. Cause like they were working with older stuff, but here it's like, there's active surveillance going on right now. And yeah, the ability to take action. I think it's very exciting. You know, it's almost like, this is cool. This is like public health in action right now that the engine has been spun up and there have been some like rocky roads along the way. um, Yeah, we're seeing sort of like what some concerted uh, attention and effort uh, can do. Yeah. Uh, So next paper, neutralizing antibodies drive spike mediated SARS-CoV-2 in evasion. So this is a this this was released a day after they announced this new strain. This was like oh part of the Cog UK collaboration. But this is almost like 
a research paper they were developing almost before this. So it's about the potential for vaccine escape. And so they look at uh, immunocompromised uh, patients. So they looked at like a group of patients who've been treated with convalescent plasma and remdesivir. And looking at the samples of like coronavirus taken from them at different parts of the infection. <laughs> so the respiratory samples were taken from these patients regularly. And they looked at the changes in the virus population structure. And they found that there were the, there was the emergence of a number of mutations, including like Delta H sixty nine B seventy, which is seen in the B one one seven. Gotcha. So, so it appeared that that um, the, the that mutation helped to accelerate the growth of the virus and impair neutralization in some of their assays, um, mm -hmm. and also it led to this kind of theorizing that uh, people with like say a long term infection were more likely to develop this mutation, kind of trying mm -hmm. to figure out. How this mutation would occur? Would it be between people? But the idea would be that in only in the long-term infection would the coronavirus have time to adapt to human physiology. Sure. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Yeah, I, I mean, it's kind of cool to see. I think what's interesting about this paper might be that idea that oh, here are real patient samples, right, where you can see the emergence of a, a viral population. Yeah. So I guess it's like almost like passaging it in humans. So in the same yeah. way the mouse, we saw like certain mutations evolve when you passage it. The longer you've got a COVID infection, the longer these more likely these mutations are to evolve. Yeah, and we've seen it too. There was a case study in immunocompromised patient with very long term infection. Right. Yeah, <clears throat> I think we did like mention that. Uh, yeah. In, in yep. Yeah, in a previous news one, it was just like a short one figure thing. Yeah, uh, yeah. It's cool that they, because what I like about this one is that it's with convalescent serum. Yes. Right. So convalescent serum being like the serum you would get if you had been infected, if you'd been vaccinated. Right. Mm. There's also if you've been vaccinated. They actually might be different, right? I think that that would probably be one of the criticisms you could levy against the paper, right? Is that like convalescent serum is not the same as vaccinated serum. Yeah. Um, because yeah, because vaccinated serum is going to drive to different antigens potentially yeah and converse serum you're already like you, so people have already had like a severe covid infection so you're almost like already throwing in a, a losing uh strain a losing like antibody response uh, <laughs> oh yeah because it wasn't able to prevent yeah but it was able to clear right it has a different yeah. function almost right it can clear the virus but maybe it can't prevent the virus from you know who knows? Yeah. who knows because like the most best the people with the best immune responses won't show up on uh mm -hmm long enough to donate convalescent serum. Um, uh, okay. So the next I one is... that's actually a yeah. potential article to read. Uh, yeah. Next one is another government uh, article. So threat assessment. So this... Um, so, yeah. Again, looking to cause, like, some fear. Uh, they've got, like, a, a couple of, like, diagrams on, like, the emergence of this new strain. So I'm going to... So I think figure four, they've got like kind of the, the phylogeny and they p pass out like, they pull out like like where, how diverse a strain has become. So it's like in the have UK. They, wait, have they, been, have they actually been calling it a strain? They they've call been, it a variant here. Ah, uh, they, they have been calling it a strain. They've been calling it a variant. So, uh, yeah. But I Just because, yeah. like, I know that I, I know that that's the, right, this week in virologies, <laughs> um, like, nomenclature gripe where like strain usually refers to something where there's a uh, distinct and proven biological impact <laughs> right. right to the difference versus yeah. things where you just know the sequence we're still trying to establish whether or not there is a significant biological um, effect yeah i think it's probably best to call it a variant but in that case yeah. because i don't think anything hit anything that we're going to present it hasn't been necessarily proven 100 percent. right uh, right Right. These are just like the the signs, right? That that should inspire caution, and yeah. the government has taken caution in this case, right? So like that's yeah. But uh, just to remember that it's not <laughs> totally known that this is some uh, terrible new viral version. <laughs> yeah, and so it, it also put, picks out that like some cases have now traveled to the Netherlands and to Australia as well. Um, and and uh, and they, it refers to a couple of tests with neutralization assays using like antibodies against it, and they point out that actually with the vaccines, they also since they elicit a T cell immunity, that's going to operate quite differently from antibody immunity. So actually, neutralization sure. tests don't necessarily indicate that 
that you're going to be vulnerable to infection, especially now with these new type of vaccines that specifically are there to elicit a T cell infection. So, so it's not well. So... <laughs> I feel like they're trying to allay fears with more unknowns because yes, <laughs> because like. Because I'm like, well, but how much is known about the T cell immunity that's being triggered by these vaccines? When we've looked at early vaccine studies, they've shown us neutralizing titers, not cell flow cytometry, right, for different T cell variants yeah. that have reactivity. Um, yeah, yeah. Anyways, I just want to say that. <laughs> no, like, I think we've never we've never talked about te tetramer, right? Like COVID nineteen tetramers or something like that. Like nothing about like uh, picking out cells that recognize. Um, antigens expressed on right like MH receptors or anything like that yeah, yeah. mhc yeah <clears throat> yeah i mean i think we've had a few t-cell studies come out of pfizer and where they've been following up on on things like um yeah uh, but that's been like a more recent thing where people have asked well what about the t-cells now and i think that's gonna become more common in the future a absolutely I, I think also to understand, because remember, like the vaccine we know works on the basis of clinical efficacy, but we don't really have the mechanistic information to back right. that up. So, like, that's going to, like, <laughs> as we get the better idea of the mechanistic information, then yeah, I'm sure we'll have a better idea of what the real risk and threat is of some of these things. Um, yeah. <clears throat> Yeah, uh, I like. I actually really like this document, though. I feel like it's laid out really nicely. Yeah, this assessment brief. Like, I, I like the headings. It's like directing me to like useful information, and then it really has like a nice plan at the end, right? Because like that's it's all about the plan, right? Like, yeah. Here are the threats, and then what's the public health plan that you're going to deploy to help ameliorate those threats? I like this document. For people who are curious, I would say maybe read this one, right? Yeah. And like get a good summary of what's going on yeah all these documents are going to be in the are in the doobly do so you can scroll down and you should be able to find this document i think this is a great starting point if you want to read about this outbreak and then you can read the other ones if you want to become unnecessarily frightened um <laughs> and other background information right like there's all sorts of things you want to get from yeah. the other ones i guess the right rest of this one uh this document do you want to keep it, like everything balanced whereas like, say, if you're a scientist and you want to get more citations, maybe it's okay to press the fit button a little bit, but I don't know. That's true. I do think that that happens. <laughs> I, I know that that happens with some people in diseases that are less uh, virulent. So they go like, oh, it's in rare cases, it causes terrifying disease. Like, okay, fine. Um, <laughs> yeah, okay. I mean, okay, so recurrent emergence and transmission of a SARS-CoV-2 spike deletion deletion H Delta H69 V70. So again, this is from the same group. Uh, this was published on December 21st. Um, so this looks at the G GISA ID data um, and checks for how frequently cl clusters of HB, uh, sorry, H69 slash V70 deletion occur. Um, there is some structural mod modeling in this paper to look at what effect this deletion may have on the spike protein structure. And they they kind of note that it, it's a, re a thing that re recurs. So it, it's occurred a number of times. Uh, so what occurred in the mink outbreak it occurred in this latest B117 outbreak. And and they conclude that it enhances viral infectivity. And and they basically say that since it's re-evolved multiple times, it must be beneficial. Yeah, but again, based on... This is just sequence... Gazing, yeah. Right? Yeah. This is. Or just do they? Oh, they do target cells. <laughs> they do cell culture. Yeah. So, uh, again, this isn't. This is a very short paper, so it doesn't really go into too much detail. But it's kind of again not adding to that story about the, what each yeah. of these mutations are doing. Yeah. Uh, the next... yeah, what each of these mutations are doing. Yeah, I guess because they do it on the structural model, I would like to yeah. They might have a really interesting hypothesis, right, based on that structural modeling as to how this might affect things. Um, but they're not in any position to show us that effect with the assay that they use at the end. No. Uh, Very cool. Yeah. I think this is what, what's exciting to me about hearing this chronology so far. It's kind of like when we talked about the D614G mutation, we were talking about it like in the past. Yeah. <laughs> right? Like it was like all this really good information, but like from something that like it kind of already happened <laughs> and the mutation was everywhere in the world already. Here's one where it's like, oh, it's like there's a pretty high prevalence in the UK. How high is the prevalence in other places in the world? It's kind of exciting to think that like we could be, <laughs> <laughs> well, of course.
just like they're maybe not exciting, but they're you have to make decisions based on this limited information. Mm. But then it kind of like we could spitball about like what could be the right, like what 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 would the next experiments that we would see, right, like that yeah. would convince us, right, that that this is a, a dangerous thing or like how it would go. And we already have a bit of a model for that, right, because we've seen in the D D six one four G mutations a bunch of evidence, and even that isn't like the best evidence to show you that it's more infective, right? But at least some sort of transmission model, I think, would really help um, yeah, cement yeah. the importance of these mutations. <clears throat> yeah. Um, so we're going to move on to the next paper, which is almost related, but because these two, this is a second story that popped up at around the same time in South Africa. So another, uh, so another uh, N501Y mutation variant appeared yep. in South Africa. So this paper, Emergence and Rapid Spread of a New Severe Acute Respiratory Syndrome-Related Coronavirus 2, uh, SARS-CoV-2 Lineage with Multiple Spike Mutations in South Africa. So a lot of news stories have been covering these two outbreaks as if they're the same outbreak, but they're actually quite different. Um, and I've got less information out of this because it didn't affect me directly, but... Uh, <laughs> right. so... But it's one of those other things where it's like, oh, maybe there's... This is the correlating evidence to say 501 n501y right is like somewhat important um and then i guess maybe the other thing why the news has picked it up right is it just like because everyone wonders if it's going to be over and here's like some bad news right that it might not be over because there could be things that uh get in the way we don't know whether or not that's the case but like here's some like doom scroll piece yep. of information right <laughs> to, to indicate that it, it might not be yeah uh yeah and um this all, they also kind of point out that South Africa also has the biggest HIV epidemic at the moment. So their their concern when monitoring this outbreak was people. yeah, and in immunocompromised people, you get prolonged viral replica replication, which can also mm -hmm. be allow for intra-host evolution. And so there's they've been keeping an eye out this for for new mutations because of this. Um, I'm uh, sorry, but and to me that just always excites. Uh, sorry, not exciting in a good way because it's very sad that this is the state mm. of the world. But like, I think these are the types of stories that drive home the point that like, like global health is everyone's health, right? And like, like other you know diseases that like might not affect your country may affect you in the end, right? Everyone's connected in sort of a huge biological sphere. We're tra I mean, we're not traveling now, but like our world is predicated on moving things between all these different regions of the world. And so uh, we have to take public health, global public health really seriously. Um, and yeah, we should be thinking about those efforts, not just as like humanitarian and the goodness of our hearts kind of deal, mm. but also pragmatically because it like affects global health, right? Yeah. Yeah, and the thing about this is, uh, they they do monitor like the timeline of things. So they see, so they start measuring like over a period of time and seeing like this this kind of mutation get fixed in their study population, and they they do actually monitor intermediate mut mut mutants. So they so with their their data, they're less convinced that it was due to the immunocompromised host, and maybe it was just like a ratcheting effect. Whereas with the B one one seven, it almost like seemed to have come out of well, almost come out of nowhere. So the the next paper is actually the most comprehensive one on terms of timeline of how this um, how the, this uh, strain came to be. So that's the CRISP. <laughs> yeah, uh, emergence and rapid. Oh no, this is not. This is so else. early empirical assessment of N five hundred one Y mutate mutant strains of SARS CoV two in the United Kingdom, October to November twenty twenty. Got it. <laughs> So yeah, this was from uh, a, a from a China, Chinese lab apparently with the, working with the WHO, and again these researchers downloaded the GISAID data, and again this is more sequence gazing, but this time looking at the emergence of of these new strains based on N501Y to look at the timing of emergence and seeing how it evolved, and they classify two main strains of N501Y. Uh, the first one emerged in Wales in early September. Wales is a country near to England. Um, <laughs> Um, for those who don't know, <laughs> for, for those who don't know, I've got an international audience. I need to to make sure, and I, I'm sure people in Wales will be very annoyed at me for justified reason because I'm English. That's just a normal thing. Uh, most of the world should be <laughs> anyway. Um, 
So yeah, a first emerged in Wales, and there's a second strain that emerged in late September in the UK. And they look at these two strains, so there's, they call them variant one and variant two. Uh, so variant one appeared like uh, increased appeared in like the early times. It only reached around like 0.1 percent prevalence, and then the second one reached 49.7 percent prevalence in November. So, so one of them was very, very prevalent. So that's the one. The second one is the one which has all the B117 mutations. So you almost get this intermediate strain. Um, yeah, that just had the. Oh, that didn't have some of the mutations. Yeah, I think. But they, it had the 501, or it had the N501Y. Yeah. So based on their data, the N501Y, it did improve things a little bit. So they did compare the transmissibility based on like how many people. Had done the growth of the infection for each strain, and they said that N501Y maybe gives about 10% more transmissibility on its own. But mm -hmm. then once you add in all the other mutations, it becomes so the the H69V70 deletion, it becomes 75% more transmissible than the original strain. Mm. So yeah, again, based on looking at sequences coming from people. <laughs> yeah, sequences, yeah. and we and from what we've seen, like some of those, the data coverage isn't necessarily perfect on that. And another thing to consider is uh, the strain that's got the deletion in it is actually quite hard to sequence because that deletion makes some of the some sequence tests less able to work. Sure, so sure. there's a lot of unknowns there. So it could be more prevalent than we e e already know. So um, yeah, but, it's interesting. So I think for me, oh sorry, did you want to say something? Oh, I mean, I was going to point out that they also tried. To, I think they tried to compare the 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 fatalities uh, to see whether these strains mm. were, were more, and they didn't find anything. They didn't see see any inclination that this strain was much different from the original version strain. Mm -hmm. So that's very similar to when the 614G was reported, right? Yeah. <laughs> they looked at the hospitalizations and they didn't see any correlation between those two. But they did see um, more people getting it. Um, yeah, I, and, and sorry, all I was, uh, what I wanted to just add to this discussion was that, again, thinking back to D614G as a template, right, for like how to understand the, the type of data that's coming out here, is that we had read a paper, there was a paper published after we read all the preprints with mm. the animal models and stuff, then there was a paper published with new computational data to say that it wasn't more transmissible. Mm. Right, but here we're starting from, and 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 that's the same the story back then too. They started from it's more transmissible, mm. <laughs> right? Uh, just looking at sequence gazing. Then they moved into animal models, right? And then later, even more people looked at the sequence and said that it wasn't. So I'd actually be really interested to. I almost think that there's probably debate inside of those people who do sequence gazing, mm. right? Like as a as their primary mode of analysis i'd like to see like the conflicting <laughs> the conflicting information there because to me that knowing that that other mutation had conflicting information on it makes me seem like well i want to know it for this one as well because then maybe i can come to a better understanding because we're, we're yeah. kind of operating right now in the absence of any um good biological data <clears throat> yeah i think that the this is all very early on so this is almost like like less than we we've this has been out for less than a week and some of these papers have been out for less than a few days. Um, the thing the thing I'd say with this one that makes it slightly different from D six one four G is that when that emerged there was a lot less coronavirus around, so yeah. the actual competition uh, is is a lot harder to pass out the comp competitive effects. Whereas with uh, this strain that you can sort of see uh, it competing in real time with the sure. original five hundred one. So I think that that might give a much more stronger backing to it. So they've got a diagram on yep. uh, figure 2A, which shows like, it shows like the decrease of the original strain and the emergence of the new strain and how they almost like level peg at certain points. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I guess that data probably wasn't, wouldn't be available back then. But again, one of those things like if we choose one of these one of these papers, right, from the initial mutation, it'd be good to compare them against the type of data that was being reported at the beginning and the end of the D614G coverage as well. Right, because maybe people have learned their lessons since the D614G coverage, and maybe... Yeah, yeah, maybe they have, and, like, this is these... Now the analyses are being done in, like, you know, the most up-to-date methodology and so forth. Um, yeah. But but I also think the point that you made is, is, is spot on, where that 
there's so much more virus now, right? So many more infective events that that lends a lot of credence to big data approaches. Um, once again, like kind of wonderfully for the scientific minded of us that want to learn about things sort of like so too bad in the terms of like the global health thing. Yeah. Just stop getting infected. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Stop getting infected. God, what's wrong with you? Uh, <laughs> Uh, yeah, I mean, uh, the thing that, I mean, because this peak was spotted around, like, November, and so it took, like, maybe about, like, 20 days for it to actually filter out and change, so maybe there was some time yeah. of people, like, arguing about whether this is something we should raise an alarm about, because there is always, because the UK, we're very concerned about false alarms, so, mm. yeah. Well, again, as I said, uh, I think when... Going back to the one where you just saw like the the amount of surveillance across the UK, right? In terms of genomes, to me, like the story that I'm hearing is like really, it's like I, I think a very responsive government, right? To to seeing a possible threat, right? Yeah. <laughs> Not knowing if it's a, if it's a full threat, but it's possible, right? And trying to take action in order to curb it. Plus, it dovetails nicely because we should be being really careful, anyways, right? Even if there wasn't this threat, right? Like it's nice to have some more justification to 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 be more careful um, yeah. but you know once again there's so many things that intersect that that's just from like my naive biological perspective of i've liked the pandemic to go away but like of course like there's all this other stuff like how yeah. does it impact businesses how is it impacting oh. right like local economy yeah, yeah mm-hmm. this is impacting uh, i mean as a lot as a kind of this is gonna be the last paper we talk about this specifically but yeah it has had a really negative effect on the uk economy and there's going to be a lot of like discussions in later years of whether this was actually the whether announcing this was the right thing to do or not. But I think that at this point, with this limited information, we're doing the best we can. So, right. yeah. Um, okay. Yeah. So that brings us to the end of uh, this big mutation thing. I think it, you know, it's definitely something that captures people's imagination, right? Like talking about these mutations because yeah, it, it sort of dovetails with a, a narrative of doom if you want to go down the road of beware, right? And um and it's one of these cases where big decisions are being made with very little data and and this is like this is the reality I think for people mm. to also absorb, right? About policy making and science and how that intersects with science right it's sort of impossible to have like the best scientific and like like there's always going to be blind spots in science right and limitations yeah. to the data and so like you just there are many other reasons to make decisions not just like pure scientific reasons <laughs> yeah so it is very difficult because you have to everybody is having to make inf- information sorry every, we all have to make decisions based on incomplete information these days yeah and this has been especially prevalent throughout the earliest parts of this coronavirus outbreak. Some people, we end up choosing going down different routes, and we don't know whether they'll be the right one or not. And that, mm-hmm. and the key is to try to <laughs> just have to rely on like that, right? The sort of like the 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 good thing that happens when you get a lot of smart people together and try to make common decisions, like aligned to principles. Like you just hope that is happening in the highest levels of our decision making practices, right? And, right. and hope for the best. Yeah, so this is a story that we will be 